Hello and welcome back to X Plane 11. This will be the next leg of my trip to New Zealand from Bavaria. We are currently in central Saudi Arabia at Kuriat and we're going to fly to Tuaraif. So let's just tune the nav radio into that channel 116.1. We're taking off towards the west, so we're going to have to make a right turn and head out on about the opposite of 252. So about 70 degrees we will go for once we make the turn. Jump in cockpit quickly now and get ourselves set up for takeoff, which hopefully won't take too long. Now I do have the frames per second showing. I've capped it at 75. The reason I have the frames showing for this flight is because I am going to be running this in 1440p for the first time I have done that in X-Plane 11 for a recording, so I just want to keep an eye on everything there. Okay, we're just getting the airplane in a position where I can start it, make sure the flaps are in the up position, which they are. Magnetos are off, throttle to idle. Master battery is off, alternator's off, fuel pump's off, everything else is off. Good mixture, lean cut. I'm just gonna put a little bit there. So brakes are on, we can now turn the battery on. And then we're going to put the mixture where it is, throttle to one quarter, fuel pump on, wait for flow, and then just shove the mixture forward. There we go. There's the dial. Good, we've got fuel. Fuel pump is off. Ignition now can be on, and then we need to jiggle the throttle and go for rich and sit for about a thousand rpm I think I'll go for 1200 doesn't seem to like low doesn't seem to like low rpm right just getting myself secure in the cockpit here and we'll turn a few things on now so what have we got alternator on please we'll turn the radios on strobe nab taxi landing and beacon Actually, landing can come off because we're not landing. Let's just check our radio set to 116.1. That is to right F. We are 75.7 nautical miles away. That'll go up before we make the turn and then it will go down. We want to turn on to about 70 degrees, I think. So we'll set that about there. Okay, we're ready for takeoff. Now, just a warning I still have a lot of trouble with ground handling in the C172. The rudders. In particular, I have a lot of trouble keeping the nose pointing in the right direction. So, see, already I'm putting in about three to five, maybe one cent, uh, three to five mils, maybe one centimeter of rudder inputs with my feet here, and it's throwing the nose all over the center line. So, apologies for that, and it's really laggy too. So a lot of lag between when I put the inputs in and when the aircraft responds. And now we're basically zigzagging about the center line. Let's get the nose up. Right, confirming flaps are up. Yes, they are. We're just going to fly it on this heading for a moment or two. I'm going to trim the nose into a climb position about there. RPM's good at 2450. We'll go with 2500. And I'm just going to recenter my track IR so it's a bit more comfortable. And we'll make a right turn very shortly. I want to make sure we're clear. Yeah, we're clear of the clear of the field. I know there's no traffic because I do not have AI turned on. AI turned off because they seem to crash X-Plane since a recent updates. If there are any AI aircraft, X-Plane crashes. We'll turn all the way around to the right here onto about 75 degrees. Well, you can see we're now 76 nautical from the, the beacon at Turaif. Uh, 
That'll do. And I'm going to climb till I get above the height of what I think this ridge is up ahead. And then we'll level off and apply the autopilot and we'll let the aircraft fly itself from that point. Just want to confirm that my flaps are up because we appear to be flying very slowly here, although I do have quite the climb on. Got full rich mixture, which I'll lean up once we get to altitude, if I decide to go for altitude. Come back onto heading. Three and a half thousand feet nearly. I may need to adjust my track IR just a little bit because it's a little bit slow and uh, I'm getting plenty of frames. It's uh, hovering around the 70 to 75 mark. It is capped at 75 so it seems to be pretty stable and smooth. The occasional stutter but nothing too serious. That stuttering is normally from the track IR as opposed to explain itself right. I think we can probably afford to level off now. Come left a bit far. Let the autopilot take over the heading. And we'll also let the autopilot take over the altitude. There we go, we are now nose level. Speed will come up quite dramatically. I may have to watch the RPM which is starting to climb. There we go, here's the airspeed coming up on 100 knots and we'll bust through that and probably get up near 120, which is going to make this about a 30 minute flight, which is excellent. This is probably a good time to have a chat about a few things flight sim related. I've decided that I'm going to use these flights to have my general chit chats and rants about things. I normally run out of stuff to talk about when flying the, uh, the civilian flights, so this is a good chance for me to exercise my verbosity. Topic that came up on the Hoggett subreddit. Um, this is the subreddit largely dedicated to DCS which is a combat flight simulator for those who are unfamiliar. The discussion of multiplayer and the state of multiplayer and the intentions for multiplayer comes up relatively regularly but there was a bit of a flurry about two weeks ago that started with a post on the ED forums, ED are the developer of DCS and then it migrated to the Hoggett uh, subreddit and the content, if I'm to paraphrase, was essentially something like this. Multiplayer is a nightmare. Can you please fix it? Um, ED don't seem interested in fixing it because single player player base is where the money is and they're not incentivized to fix multiplayer. So we can break this down and have a bit of a chat about it. I personally agree that the multiplayer environment in DCS needs some work it's a little unstable for my liking. There are not really the ability to add more than about 30 players before servers start becoming quite unstable and about a couple of hundred ground units. If ground units have waypoints and are moving about the map and engaging other ground units, it grinds to a halt very quickly. And it seems to be something that is almost exclusively problematic in multiplayer. Now I understand that Eagle Dynamics' own internal data, as far as we've been told by them, indicates that the vast majority of the player base in DCS is in fact single player. And that somewhat disincentivizes them to spend large amounts of development time working on the multiplayer environment due to the fact that it apparently has a much 
smaller player base. This is something that I find a little bit uh, concerning and I think this is one area where Eagle Dynamics might want to be very careful about their own data. And the reason I say that is because I think if you were to look at my own user profile of DCS, then the data you would get would be very misleading indeed. So I spend at least, I would think, more than half of my time in DCS outside of multiplayer. So if you were to just drag up a statistical report of where I spend my time, most of it, and I'm willing to say it would even be above 75%, would be in single player. This is because I spend a lot of time in the mission editor, and I also spend time in single player mission testing things, recording stuff for YouTube, doing all sorts of bits and pieces. However, the reason I own DCS, and the main thing I want from it, is a stable multiplayer environment. So for me, the 25% or whatever it is of my time that I spend in multiplayer is the reason I purchase the game and the modules. However, if you were just to look at my statistical data, you wouldn't be an idiot for assuming that I would rather be playing single player or that the, the reason I own the platform is to play single player. So this is why I think developers, and Eagle Dynamics in particular, need to be very careful about the data they have access to especially if it's time spent by user in the platform. Now there's another reason why a lot of us spend not much time in multiplayer, even though we might want to, and that is because in many respects the multiplayer environment is unstable or broken. And so we can't spend the time that we want to because the platform doesn't allow us. I don't know how many people are in that position, but from reading on the forums and in the subreddit on Hoggett, it seems to me that a lot of people are in a similar boat. They would spend more time in multiplayer, they want to spend more time in multiplayer, but they don't due to the stability reasons. So I think this is one more piece of evidence pointing towards the data set perhaps being unreliable. If you're just basing your decision making on existing player use trends, what I would do to get the best data is try and conduct a survey find out how many people would rather be spending more time in multiplayer but can't for various reasons. Try and get a feel for exactly what the demand is for the multiplayer environment amongst your customer base. Okay, we've spent too long talking about DCS now. I don't really have much to talk about with respect to uh, X-Plane at the moment. Um, there are a couple of things I've noticed though recently whilst playing that I really wish would be worked on and one of them is this which you can also see back there the shadows being very rough around the edges and flickering like mad I do see this in other flight sims as well it seems to me that a lot of developers have trouble with smooth transitions from shadow to not shadow and that you end up either with these very abrupt lines which you can see at the bottom of this shadow or you end up with these horrific kind of grid patterns where the system is trying to render the line as a series of I don't know what and as I zoom out it gets worse although down the bottom gets better and it's rendering it differently as I close in on it here by narrowing my field of view. These shadows are quite good so sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong however these ones are still a very abrupt transition you can see there it's a straight line with very little blending between and here it's all messy again very little blending between the non-shadowed and the shadowed areas. I've got no problem with exaggerating the blend in such sims. I would rather have a line that is not flickering around and jumping and squared and horrific like this, but has an, unnatural, an unnaturally high 
amount of blending from shadow to non-shadow than to have it this way around. Sharp shadows don't always look great. And the sharper the shadow, the more prone it is to wriggling around like that. So I'd like to see trans, um, really broad transitions. It looks like this one over here has a, a broad transition when I'm zoomed out, but when I zoom in, it goes all. That's not too bad. If I bring my mouse in here, you can see there's a straight line there and there's a second line there. So this, I think, is a sort of a transition, but it's still too, it's still too sharp. I'd, I'd, I'd rather see it start way back here and start getting lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. Um, just with a, a feathered kind of transparency. So, how far have we got to go? 54 nautical miles, bit of a trick. I was considering heading down to an airfield more to the southeast, but Sky Vector and the game were giving me distance of 130 to 170 nautical miles, so I've decided to go slightly off track to the northeast in order to add a couple of airfields in with shorter distances between them. That way we can get these recordings done in the sort of 30 minute to one hour space. Let's go for a little RPM here, try and get that speed up, try and add another 5 to 10 nautical, well, 5 to 10 knots. We're just over 4,000 feet, which is a nice altitude. And it looks like I need to move to the right. So I'm going to do that. Probably going to try and overfly the the radial that I want to be on. In fact, I'll get over onto about the two. Yeah, we're nearly there. We're not too far off. I'm just going to try and push us back out over the other side of the radial and then recorrect. But it's going to be a slow process because I've only hit eight zero degrees, so I'm only flying over it by a few degrees. RPM's right up at the top there, so I better just keep an eye on the temps and pressures. We look okay though. My fuel's going to be down below 10 gallons on both sides. Probably down near 5 by the time we get to the end of this flight, so we will have to fuel up for the next flight. We've got a tailwind in this direction, so we should also be making some good ground speed. You can see that's ticking down quite quickly now, doing 115 knots. So we should be 20 minutes through this 48 nautical miles. Just realized they didn't set my transponder. Just leave it on 2000. It's on standby. Had my taxi light on still for some silly reason. It's off now. So this is the desert texturing. It's pretty basic. I would love to be running Ortho XP, but because I'm flying across such large distances, I'll be constantly downloading map tiles. So what I'm thinking of doing is when we get to the end of this trip, when we arrive in New Zealand, I will download Ortho XP for the entire country. 
and then we'll have um, a more restricted area to fly around with better scenery but these textures these default textures here over the desert are pretty basic it's a very boring day to be flying I must say flat monotonous landscape a very monotonous looking sky a few clouds way out but oh. this is not fun flying that's for sure so I know this uh, this series of videos is the least watched on my channel um, I'm happy to keep recording them but uh, I'd love to think of ways that I can get more of the civilian flight sim community interested in this series. It's uh, pretty slow going though, getting around the world. And I think I originally gave myself a one year expectation. I think we're at a year and a half now. And we're still only in Saudi Arabia. It's, um, finding the time to record these is often the difficulty for me. I've got a window of about an hour and a half currently in real life, so I thought I'd try and jump in and get this flight done and um, hope that I don't get interrupted before I manage to bring this airplane down. Fuel is showing a drop now, actually. I'm going through about one gallon per 10 nautical miles, it seems. Yeah, 13, it sounds about right, 13 gallons per hour. And in an hour, I'm getting about 110 nautical miles. Yeah, so it's a, almost... 10 nautical miles to the gallon off by a 10% or so but that's okay I do have high fuel flow though I'm pushing this airplane along so let's just reduce the RPM down to 24 yeah in fact I'm going to bring the fuel flow back into the green there we go I think we've probably just been pushing that a little bit hard for a little bit long now. That brings me back onto 2500 RPM or so. We'll get a bit slower, but I think it's tolerable. I'm almost bang on the radial now. You can see we've been correcting very slowly. And I need 073-ish mm, about. So I'm actually going to come left now. Five, probably five degrees. Just make a little adjustment there. Zero seven four, zero seven five there or thereabouts. Thirty seven nautical miles to go. We're tracking on zero seven eight. It's probably a little bit further around than I want actually. Let's bring it back to two more degrees. Zero seven six. Now we're almost spot on on the radio. We want so we just chase the needle for a while there and it's dragged it back onto the correct radio or dragged us back onto the correct radio can have a little look at the map now I think just to see what we've done as you can see we're almost flying parallel but I was just diverging a fraction so then I came right crossed this radio here which is the actually the direct one in and now I've just lined up a little bit better but we're parallel and off to the right a bit runways we've got Two eight and a one zero. So we're going to use the two eight. I'm going to fly in on the current heading. 
and then I'm going to turn right on the downwind and make a left base turn and land into wind on the 2.8. Coming up on 30 nautical miles. Really looking forward to the day when we can have multi crew in these things. It would be really nice to fly this with uh, someone else and then switch pilots at. Um, at certain points, I'd have to put the yokes in and have the someone sitting in the right hand seat there and um, someone sitting in the left and you can then do longer journeys, you could do half an hour each and then two flights which are up around the 110 to 120 nautical mile range get those done for a video, that would be nice I think there are some third party mods you can add or scripting or something but I'm not entirely comfortable with doing that for X-Plane 11. My modding experience in this game is very limited. I wouldn't mind getting IVAO running again sometime soon, but because I'm flying to these very small airfields out in the middle of nowhere, I found that it, there's almost no chance of someone controlling them or being other human traffic around. But I do have a couple of fairly large international airports not too far away down the trip, especially once we hit the Gulf, the Persian Gulf. I've got um, potentially Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, Dubai. We might cross over into Iran across the, uh, the Gulf I'll see. So we might actually use IVAO for some of that. That'll be about two or three flights time. And then we might see some other humans flying about. Might get a bit of air traffic control as well that we have to deal with. So if anyone knows how to reduce the sensitivity of the nose wheel without reducing the sensitivity of the rudder, I would very, be, very much like to know that. I find the nose wheel far too sensitive in this aircraft, but the rudder when in flight is, is just about right. So if there's a way I can separate those two controls, that would be very much appreciated. Okay, I need to come left now. We'll go about four degrees left. And the needle's just wandering off to the left. We're only 27 nautical miles out. So we'll be thinking about our setup for landing in the not too distant future. Just do some checks here. Fuel is at about eight gallons now. T's and P's are in the green. Airspeed's good. Compasses are aligned. Need to come left again. Rather a bit more. On the correct radio. Flaps are up, lights are all off, we've got power, tickety boo. Sooner or later we'll start seeing this airfield 24 miles away. It's going to be basically straight ahead. 
I do have a shadowy sort of maybe vegetated area over there it looks like a river perhaps it's amazing how this um, field of view works in X-Plane 11 it's almost unlimited you can just keep going and going and going obviously it's very hard to control with uh, track IR here but if I freeze track IR for a second if I can remember the key to freeze it no I can't never mind let's just keep zooming Whoa. okay there it is track IR is frozen so I can just keep zooming and zooming and zooming it never ends <laughs> it starts getting really distorted but you can zoom in a bloody long way What I think I'll do now is uh, descend a fraction. I do need to know what the air pressure is at the airfield. Set for 122.8, I think. Might as well do that. So it's tried to bring up track um, team speak too, unfortunately, because of uh, IVAO plugin sort of running in the background. Don't know if I bother putting a call in though. Actually, I might just leave it. And ah, altimeter is two nine eight eight. There we go. It is actually saying it on here, on this map. It's kind of handy. I don't have to call in for it. 2988. Good. I will set that then. And that's pretty much where it is. But we're just going to go up a little bit. 298.8. So I need to come left. There. That's about it. So we're basically correct anyway. Two eight oh three feet above MSL. It's quite high up, up in the desert. I'm guessing that's probably the city over here then. No sign of the airfield though. I do have some structure over there. Which could be a. That's the airfield there. Pretty sure that's it. No, maybe not. It looked like there may be some tarmac with a couple of radio ish looking structures. We'll see as we get closer. We've still got a good 15 nautical to go. But we're on the final stretch now. I will start slowing down. What I'm going to try and do is hit about 95 to 100 knots. Just staying below or above the flap safe flap airspeed and also just above that and that just makes it a little bit easier later on to slow down I have a tendency to come in always way too high and way too fast so the sooner I can get this airplane slowed down the easier my workload is going to be at the other end planning ahead something I'm not particularly great at but I'm going to do a little bit of that now almost on 2100 RPM I 
a bit slow now, so a bit more RPM. Just to get us back over that mark, and we need to come left again. And we've just been drifting off to the right of our intended heading for a wee while now. So we're 10 miles out. Now the map definitely shows an air, airfield out here. There should be a runway which goes left to right straight in front of me somewhere. So let's have a look, see if we can see it again. There are some cars up ahead, I can see vehicles on the roads. No sign of an airfield though. Let's try this way. The two parallel pieces of tarmac out there. Oh yeah, I think I see a threshold in fact. I think I see a threshold over there. It's going to be very hard to find this again. There. Bingo. There it is. Turaif, we have found you. So I'm going to turn right parallel to this runway and then make a left base. I'll wait till I'm about two nautical miles from the field. Well, I'll turn it about four nautical miles and then I'll try and place myself two nautical miles off to the side. The airfield is at 2,800 feet. So it's probably only going to be 2,000 below us. I'm not sure if this desert has been steadily climbing. I think it probably has a very gentle gradient up towards the center of the desert. So the ground's going to be a little bit closer to us than it was at the last airfield. Bit of a town here, houses and everything. Very American style or European, Western European, I uh, look quite American style housing. This is just default stuff that's here. I'm pretty sure the housing doesn't look anything like that here in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert. green lawns and whatnot. I know they have got large sections of the desert which have been greened but um, who knows if this is one of them. So we are closing in now. On the landing we've got four miles to go before I make my turn and that'll put us close in to the field itself. Welcome to Turaif, everybody. Let's get some lights on then. I will put the landing light on now, I think. Everything else is set. We've got voltage, we've got fuel. We've got plenty of fuel. We can go around a couple of times if we need to. Airspeed is sitting there very nicely, just where I wanted it. And I'm not going to kick that up anymore. We'll turn the autopilot off shortly once I make the turn which is going to be in about three miles. I think we'll be turning over this town. And you can see the threshold now, quite clear. There's the runway. And we will be landing into wind by the looks of that windsock. Perhaps a little bit of a crosswind.
So I'll go for about, I think, 80 knots in the downwind. Hopefully I can achieve that without going too low on the RPM. Check fuel is mix rich. Brakes are off, critical. Fuel flow shows us on. You can see the aircraft's trimming away here to keep me stable at this altitude. It's the autopilot doing that. Okay, we've hit the 80. That's the speed I want. 5.8 nauticals. Turning in less than a mile, I think. A mile to less than a mile. Probably going to turn a little bit earlier than I first said I would. I want to return on to 010. No, I don't. That's interesting because what's it giving me for the runway headings here? Yeah, 2810. That looks a bit strange. I guess that's 28. Oh, yeah, 10, 100, not 010. Okay, we're going to turn on to 100 degrees. It's just me being a bit of an idiot there. So, let's use the autopilot, in fact. And that means we know we'll be on the downwind parallel to the runway. There's the runway over there at the 10 o'clock position. So, rolling out on... 100, that's about fine. I'll take that. Downwind. Very stuttery now. And I think it's the houses calling that, causing that. I'm still getting my 75 frames per second. So this is not a frame rate issue. This is something else. It's just stuttery. Stuttery, not buttery. Okay. Going to come left just a fraction. 80 knots, T's and P's are good. Landing lights on. Mixture for rich. Everything is tally and tickety for the base turn which we will do once our threshold is over there pretty much a 45 degree angle back behind me on the left that's when I'll make my base turn and I think I'll do a nice square base because if we do a turning base all the way around we'll end up way inside the line of the runway and because we're flying a civilian aircraft, we can afford to do a civilian shaped circuit. We need to turn on to zero one zero for the left here. Just have a quick look at the map and see how it's tracked my little path along here. Ah, that's a nice parallel heading, parallel to the runway. Fantastic. I could actually turn when I get onto the, the right radial, when my nav radio shows the radial being 45 degrees behind me. would take a few seconds of math to work out what radio I'd need to be on. But I'm going to do this visually. But I guess if we were flying IFR, then we could do that. We could do a circuit in IFR. I think I need a little bit of practice before putting that on the YouTube channel. IFR circuits using the nav radio. There we go, we've just flicked to the from position on the radio now. 
We are now flying away from the airfield and it's showing at about 20 degrees beyond the trailing edge. I'm going to keep going until it gets to the 45 degree position which I'm going to say is about here. So we're going to be turning soon onto 010. I would like to give up some altitude, I think. But we'll do that in the base leg. We'll drop a few feet. Actually, I don't need to. I think I can just come in at this. I think I can come straight in at this altitude. It doesn't look like I'm high. And we'll use the Pappy lights to give our adjustment, if they've got them. Okay, that's 45 degrees. I'm now going to turn on to 010. Round and round and round she goes. Where she stops, nobody knows. Well, where she stops, everybody knows. It's going to be on a heading of 010 for an approach into the 28 runway at Turaif. We can just take a very quick external look here as the turn is leveled off. jump in so now we're going to wait till we've got not much more autopilot off or at least altitude off gonna turn the whole thing off in fact okay and we're going to descend a little and then we're going to start the left turn and the flaps will come down as soon as I'm happy with the left turn. Let's make the turn now. Keeping my airspeed at 8.0 as we go around. I'm inside the line of the runway here, so I've turned a bit too sharp. And first flap. Airspeed's coming down. Okay, so actually, because these aeroplanes go so slow, you can afford to leave the turn until the last minute. I'm used to having quite an, make an early turn with the faster aircraft. Certainly the jets that require a much, much earlier turns due to the vast difference in airspeed. But this thing, you can basically wait till you got the wingtip on the threshold and then you can make the turn because they don't really cover much ground when they are making that turn. We've got four white lights so we're going to let this bleed off. Always too high. My eternal problem. Yeah, way too high now. Really it starts becoming obvious when you get in close here like this. Full flap. Now we're just floating along now. Super, super low RPM. Just hope I can keep my voltage up. Doesn't look like we're going to get the pappy lights we need, the two reds and the two whites. It looks like we're going to be high all the way here. So I'll just extend the landing down the runway a bit. This aeroplane comes to a halt in pretty short distance once the wheels are down. Okay, I will actually put my feet up on the rudders now. Should have had that done already, but just a bit lazy. Now we're pretty much lined up. Just got to kick it around a bit. We do have a crosswind. It's not strong, but it is there. very slight. I'm very tempted to bring the nose up and gain some more height here, which I'm not going to do. Shouldn't be using the nose for that purpose anyway. Power is for altitude at this approach. 
Okay, coming in relatively stably. There's my first red light. So just left it a bit late to get lined up, but that's okay. Now, I've also got my perennial problem with the ground handling, the nose wheel being awful. Okay, just lift. And let the nose wheel settle. Handling problems kick in now. Flap up, flap up, flap up. Okay, stick fully forward so the nose stays on the. Oh, geez, there it goes there. I'm hardly touching the rudder. Jeez. Okay, I'm going to lift the nose wheel off. That's better. Take off the nose wheel steering. That's actually better, just lifting the, um, lifting the nose wheel up with the elevator. Okay, so I don't see any exit, unfortunately. It looks like it's one of these airfields. And it's, ah, there may be something coming up on the left here. Can I use it? Can I get there in time? Just throw the taxi light on. Okay, looks like we can. Just too low RPM for a second there, but it's okay. We've got full, full rich mixture. Taxi off here. Okay, we've done it. We've done it. Turaif, here we are. Nothing here. No airplanes, no civilians, no nothing, no buildings. It's just a blank canvas, this airfield. A few of these we've found on our journey. This happens when you use these out-of-the-way airfields. Okay. Yeah, we're sloppy here. We're very sloppy here going to bring the airplane to a close just on this piece of tarmac. I'm not going to exit into any kind of parking area because there don't seem to be any. I'm just going to use this piece of concrete that we're on. All them lights off. Okay, I need to put the brakes on now quite quickly here. And then we'll lean the mixture. Oh, should have turned the radios off first. Sorry. Sorry, uh, REP, I always forget to do that. Radios off first, then kill the engine. Otherwise, you can damage the radios. I've got to get into the habit of doing that, actually. Good. We have arrived at Turaif. Let's take a look at the replay of the landing, which we do every time. On approach then, external views here. I'll try and get a view where we can see the, the landing itself. Lineup wasn't too bad. Wings are slightly left down, correcting there. And I don't think this was a great touchdown. It felt a bit heavy. We did level off and I put sauce on. There's me putting the engine on. Flying down the runway. Okay, that looked a lot better from this angle than it felt like in the cockpit. It says they do not land with the brakes on. The tires are damaged and may explode. That is because X-Plane still thinks I'm parked over here with my brakes on. And so it's landed the airplane in the replay mode with me having the control set to brakes. But when I landed, the brakes were off. It's just a problem with how replay mode works. But there we go. We're down at Turaif. That was a nice flight. 1440p seems to be working just fine. A few stutters, but overall, not bad. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.